Welcome. We're here at Balticon 50 here in the Inner Harbor, and we're here with multiple Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Award winner, Kim Stanley Robinson. Stan, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tom. It's good to be back. And congratulations on being the 2016 winner of the Robert Heinlein Award. Uh, Thanks. It was presented last night, yeah. and that was a remarkable acceptance speech you gave. Well, thank you. It was a moving occasion for me. Um, uh, Heinlein is, a, you know, one of the major figures in science fiction, and then um, because he was, this award was supposed to be for writers who encourage uh, the idea of space travel. It was a chance to remember my uh, late friend Charles Sheffield, who was a very important friend to me and taught me a lot about space. He was a remarkable gentleman. He was. Yeah, he was my tech support and a close friend. And really, when we lived in Washington, D.C., um, we came here and didn't know anybody. So Charles kind of took us under his wing. So that was really important. Well, it's also, you know, everything, most of your other awards have been, I mean, the, the Hugo, the, have been for specific works of fiction. Right. And this is more a recognition of the body of the work and the influence you've had on the community and the way that you have, in, in what you have written about and how you've written it. Yeah, that's right. That's how, I, how it was characterized and uh, that's how I understand it. And it's meaningful for that too because um, I think that um, the idea of going out into the solar system was a, a kind of an engineering idea and the, the cultural effects of it, the, the exploration of the solar system as a kind of literary uh, event a new literary space was, I think, um, one of the things that I would been contributing to. And so give it a different um, feel to the, mm -hmm. the science fiction that was space oriented. You know, uh, the last time we talked, let me see if I've got my notes correct here. Uh, we were basically in the back end of uh, the uh, Science in the Capital series. You'd flooded Washington. Oh, uh, yeah. You had allowed it to somewhat stagger back to life because they couldn't just let it rot. That didn't mean they had to do a proper job of rebuilding the city. Uh, and since then, you have, God, your output is absolutely stunning sometimes. I, I am amazed. Uh, the last two, the last uh, two of the last three novels you've written, there was uh, 2312, which was a right. Hugo. It was nominated for the Hugo in 2013. Uh, and, and it won the Nebula. I and, and it won the Nebula. I mean, yeah. you know. And very, um, I think I'm the longest gap of years between winning the Nebula for the novel because it was almost 20 years, I think. Well, just, nice. I mean, you know, it, it just, it, it shows a level of consistency over time, I guess. And, and it, it, 2312 was, was, was an interesting book in that you set it on Mercury, and you had the gall to put a, a, a city on rails yeah. as, it, as it raced the sun when people were basically walking the sun just, as, just for exercise, you know, kind right. of like, like, like some of our, our adrenaline junkies do now in various sports here in the world. Um, and it was the first time, I think, that artificial intelligence played a significant role in the run of the plot line. You had some AIs. I believe there were several that were basically still trying to get, it, it was almost like they were perpetually studying for the Turing test and, and something like that. That's right. Um, I, I think that is the first uh, serious engagement with AI in my work. I, I mostly hadn't believed in it and I still am dubious, but uh, I went to some talks down at the Google complex down in Mountain View, California on uh, quantum computing and the scientists working on quantum computing convinced me that if they could stabilize the qubit and make quantum computing work, you would have extraordinarily fast computers that really make our current computers, which are already very fast, yes. um, look like nothing, look like um, you know dial-up telephones. So uh, when I understood what they were saying, I began to think, you know, the Turing test is a rather low bar because we fool each other all the time. And, you know, we believe our cars are sentient and our cell phones, and so... We uh, believe our cats and our, yeah, and our dogs yeah. are sentient. We project, and so the Turing test is a low bar. And there are more interesting tests of artificial intelligence, of how good it is as a general intelligence, like the Winograd supplement and tests like that. So I began to think, well, it would be at least a very, very interesting conversational partner. And if you teamed that up with a, uh, a body robot, an android, 
that was also artificial, and you begin to have the uncanny valley problem of like, am I a, a, an artificial construct or am I, a, you know, Stan? Mm -hmm. And how can you tell? And then running the tests that you might run and having the uncertainties that you might ha have, and the uncanny valley uh, are these people of goodwill or bad, or are they m maybe functionally insane? Um, that began to seem like a plot to me and was really one of the drivers of 2312, as well as the solar system. And then you stepped into Aurora, which uh, was your generational tr space travel. You, would, you talk often about the realities that we face and how the solar system is our, is our neighborhood. It's, yes. it's what we can do, it's what we can conceive of within a lifetime going from A to B to C and back, that type of a thing in terms of our current technologies and immediately future technologies that we're envisioning. Uh, why did you decide you wanted to study uh, the implications of generational star travel? What was it that brought that as something that would be interesting to write about? And well, several times in my novels there have been characters driven to leave the solar system on starships. I think it happens in Ice Henge, it happened in Blue Mars, and um, in 2312 as a kind of a prison exile sentence. So the, it kept coming up. And also this notion that we can go into space, I, I saw all over our culture this notion that humanity can go to the stars, that in fact humanity should go to the stars, it's our destiny. If we didn't go, it would be some kind of species failure. And it's kind of an old 19th century idea that has been promulgated by science fiction, especially space opera, where we zip around the galaxy all the time. It, it, it's kind of, a, kind of a, a natural iteration of the United States con concept of manifest destiny back in the 1800s. Yes, it's humanity's manifest destiny is to inhabit this galaxy. Now, the thing is that recent results out of biology, the fact that we've got this microbiota that's inside us, that half of the DNA in our bodies is not human DNA, but is actually from thousands of other species of bacteria that we can't characterize that's mutating faster than we are, it implies that we're um, ecological problems of much more complication than we had been thinking. And then we have not tested having babies in low gravity or um, living out of the magnetic um, uh, field of the Earth well enough to know anything about whether we can um, be healthy over the long haul in a multi-generational starship. And the stars are really far away. And this is another thing that it's uh, the best way I've found to point it out is that the distance from here to the moon, which we have indeed traversed in a, in a spaceship, Tau Ceti, which is a very close star, is 10 billion times further away. Right. And 10 billion is a big uh, magnitude jump. And in that leap, that quantitative difference becomes a qualitative difference, I think. And I guess I thought all of the evidence was coming together to suggest that we can't get out of the solar system and inhabit the stars. Because actually getting there is only the first part of the problem. When you get to another planet somewhere, say you've already sent probes at light speed, you see you've got a water planet, it looks Earth-like, it's got a, the right chemical composition. It's either going to be alive or it's going to be dead. If it's alive, you have a problem. Do you coexist with the alien without um, allergies without um, an invasive response. Maybe it would work, but how do you find out without testing it? And, and with the mutability you discuss with our bacteria and everything else like that, how would that, if we successfully integrated with the existing ecology, how would that change us? Yeah, you never can tell. It would be an experiment. It could, it could go well, but it could end disastrously. Um, and you couldn't tell in advance without experimentation. The other option is the planet's dead, then you've got to terraform it with only the resources of one starship to bring to bear, and terraforming a planet that has a, an Earth-like gravity, 1G, that's a big planet. If it's dead, a rock, maybe with some ice, you've got a massive, um, thousands of years would have to pass before you could adequately terraform that planet. Either way, you're stuck in tin cans for an enormously long time. And um, without the guarantee of a successful result, you've got many generations. They're going to, A, go crazy, B, go sick, and then C, probably go extinct. It, and and but the thing is, is that no matter what we do, no matter how hard we build it, we still, until we progress uh, tremendously, we're never going to truly understand at a micro level what we're transporting. We know some of the interactions, but we don't know we don't know the basics about some of the most some of the most basic, some of the smallest elements in the ecosystem 
that are absolutely necessary and key. Right. We don't know we, whether we're helping them or destroying them. That's true. I mean, you can imagine us getting really, really good at ecology and um, microbiology. You could imagine us also living inside uh, terraria like in 2312, where you're inside a hollowed out asteroid, you're spinning it, you're on the inside, you're protected, you've got gravity, you've got water. You could imagine hundreds of years of testing of these various systems and possibly coming to the conclusion that this will work and let's try it. And then you might shoot off to some other star system where there's a promising planet ready mm -hmm. to go. That means you've got probably thousands of years of practice, of learning. And so what I was also responding to in Aurora was this idea that we needed to do it soon, that there was some kind of second Earth available if we torched this one. All, this, uh, all these notions that are kind of banging around our culture um, casually and carelessly. Right. I wanted to uh, push on them and say, look, there is no planet B. We can't get to the stars. Maybe in 5,000 years we'll have learned enough to get to the stars, but are we going to be around in 5,000 years if we don't solve our problems here on Earth right now? Exactly. It, so. It's like when in, in, 2000, in 2312 when you had one of your protagonists come back to the Earth and she had that, she's sitting there and she's breathing the air. It's natural. It's, it, it, it's, it's of the place where her ancestors came from and all right. of that and the revelation, the marvel that she has. Yeah. That this is here. Right. And this is where we belong. It, in most of it, I mean, even in Aurora, eventually, what you have is, I need to go home. Yeah. And you return, and, and what, what, what the survivors of the experiment, which is essentially what it was, and tossing them out there and seeing what, kind of like throwing it against the wall and seeing if it sticks. Yeah. But for generations of people who had no choice in the matter after the first crew members, uh, it's like if, you know, that's all great, but if we don't have a place to go from that we can get back to, what's the point? I, we, we, if we can't take care of what we've got, all we're going to do is screw something else up. Right. I, I, I wanted 2312 and Aurora work in uh, combination with the rest of my work, including the Mars books, to mm -hmm. say, well, maybe we could um, terraform Mars. Maybe we can make scientific stations all through the solar system and have people happily living out there. But in 2312, I suggested that they all needed to come back to Earth for a kind of sabbatical year, one year in seven, to renew their microbiota by living in Earth's dirt. And, being, uh, and they don't even know why. It's, causa it's, um, it's a correlation rather than causation, but they've noticed that they tend to live longer if they spend some time back on Earth and get a reset on all kinds of biological systems. This is just guesswork on my part, but mm -hmm. I wanted to suggest that since we co-evolved with Earth itself and we're completely imbricated with all the other living creatures, including the ones inside us and the ones that, are, that we eat, the ones that eat us, the ones mm -hmm. that are uh, crawling around, that we might never be able to get away from that and live in an artificial system of our own that is literally one trillionth the size of the Earth's surface, that we might not be able to do it. And so. People have accused me of being inconsistent or being pessimistic. I'm just trying to react to the latest scientific information and make a new story. And I want the stories to be interesting and provocative. Mm -hmm. And the new information that we're getting, you don't want to be writing science fiction now that is based on ideas that we formed back in the 1930s or the 1950s. That would form a kind of nostalgia fiction, um, maybe space opera, like Star Wars is nostalgia fiction. It, or there's it, artificial gravity and you can immediately create anything out of pure energy when you need it. And you can go faster than light and you can talk to aliens in English in a second. I mean, there's a, there's a genre called space opera and it can be fun. It's a story space that it has a lot of pleasures and even um, uh, some educational value in like the work of Ian Banks or these British uh, uh, new space opera writers. They're not just doing Star Wars, which I think is really a nostalgia trip and almost uh, kitschy or campy in a way that I, doesn't appeal to me. I'm just not into it. What I like is uh, more the new wave era of uh, trying to be provocative and interesting in new ways. So now we are in 2016 and we've been learning things and what we've been learning should be making new stories. Otherwise science fiction isn't doing its job. It's just um, turning into a nostalgia genre, which mm -hmm. you know, it needs to be more than, uh, science fiction is forward looking. You know, it's like fast forward. You, you've got to be looking forward and not playing in a, a, a little pond that was made in the past from previous ideas. That would be bad. Now, you've got a new book coming out, New York 2140, coming yep. out next year. Yeah, that's right. 
And it seems to me like, I as I understand it, it's basically sitting there in the middle of the timeline between now and 2312? It kind of is. Uh, 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 yes, because it's about a century and a half ahead, and uh, 2312 was exactly 300 years. Yes. Okay. And, and like the uh, uh, Science in the City series, uh, we, have, we are dealing with and adapting to some serious problems of our own causation in regards to our biosphere and the uh, and sea level rise. Right. I, it's becoming clearer and clearer that climate change, which has started and is going to be happening, um, is going to also cause sea level rise because there's much more unstable ice on Antarctica and in Greenland than we realized. And if the rate of melting uh, doubles every 10 years, this recent paper by James Hansen and another paper in Nature by a different set of writers, scientists, uh, is suggesting that sea level rise can be faster than we thought and higher than we thought. So um, New York 2140 is not a prequel. It doesn't fit into any future history of mine. I don't do future histories. Things happen differently in this one. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I push the sea level rise as, as fast and as high as is plausible, right to the far edge, like the speed of terraforming on Mars. And quite honestly, all of the predictions from five years ago are now seen as ridiculously conservative. Yeah, and that might keep happening. So I have a 50-foot 50, um, 50 sea level rise so that lower Manhattan becomes like a super Venice. And a 50-foot sea level rise creates a kind of a 10,000 Katrinas uh, uh, refugee situation um, in terms of the number of humans that would become refugees. So we have a very altered Earth and a kind of an emergency century. And, and, and we're not dealing that well with what we have right now, so there are problems in, in that in terms of the base, basic human nature and the social systems that we have available to cope with uh, situations like that. Yeah, it's true, but I think there might, this might be a forcing action that will get new social systems to try to cope. And it might be closing the barn door after the horses have le uh, gotten out, but on the other hand, it'll make for a very interesting social situation. At the very least. Yeah. So besides drowning New York City and turning it into the new Super Venice, anything else on the horizon? Well, that is just now done, so I'm still revising that one. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a couple more novels in mind that will follow, but um, for now I'm still, you know, underwater. One step at a time. Yeah, in the intertidal, as I call it. In the intertidal. Yeah. Well, we'll end with that because we're almost out of time. Stan, thank you so much for stopping by, and again, Congratulations on the Highland Award. Oh, richly deserved. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. It's really a pleasure. I, I guess it's been 10 years, so we got to do it more frequently. Than yes, that. we do, because yeah. I don't have another another 25 <laughs> yeah, years do to do it. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, well, we'll do it. That'll be fun. Okay, good enough. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest, and we hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Shad saying, take care.